Ooh. Ladies and gentlemen, swab yourselves and hoist the mainsails figures. Mainsails, sails figures. No, it is time for what may well be our biggest review of 2016, but first, a history lesson. It was 2011 when Hasbro designers Rob Davio and Chris Dupuy created Risk Legacy, an astonishing box offering a group of players a war game where their board, the world, even the game itself evolved and became personalised over an endlessly surprising campaign. In 2015, Davio, now a free agent, collaborated with Pandemic designer Matt Leacock on Pandemic Legacy, a gripping story taking players through a whole year in the game of cooperative disease control that took the top of my head off. Last year, I called it the greatest board game ever made. This year, at long last, we get Seafall, Davio's first legacy game that isn't a spin-off of an existing title, but is built from the ground up as an ever-evolving box of secrets. And this game of ships and colonization is surfing in on an impossible wave of hype. And that's bad, because ships aren't meant to surf. So today, why don't you let Shut Up and Sit Down wrangle that game down to earth and let you know what we think. Today, I'm in London's old Royal Naval College and I'm gonna be walking through it very slowly like I'm in a documentary, but not just because I'm a pretentious twat. It's because we can't show you much of our lovingly tested copy of C4 because it's all covered in spoilers. So I decided to be here because at least this place has a history of brave captains plotting ambitious projects. It's just a terrible idea. It's an arts university now, and wherever I set up the camera, there's just a dude playing a trumpet, and now I want him to die. Anyway, if you've not heard of C4, here's the gist. When you start your campaign, between three to five players all represent proud, seafaring nations, sending ships into uncharted oceans in search of glory and possibility. And just like in the real Age of Sail, the first nation to collect a certain amount of glory points is declared the winner, everyone goes home, and then you all go back to the starting line and try again in the next game. Where C4 gets interesting, and by the way, it's going to stay interesting for the rest of this review, is all the different focuses players can have on game in glory. You can be a trader, buying spice and linens cheaply and selling them back home for a profit, and acquiring fabulous treasures. You can also employ resources you bring home as a discount when you construct buildings or ship upgrades, leaving behind a legacy of stone and stories. You can also earn glory as a soldier, launching daring raids and taking what you want by force, running the risk that the players or islands you rob will become hostile to you in every future game of Seafall. Or maybe, just maybe, you'll choose to be an explorer, reaching the highest mountaintops and most guarded caves of these misty islands, or even finding new lands, having quaint, multiple-choice adventures read to you from a book of tales, and best of all, applying stickers to the board, each one offering new avenues of exploitation for everybody else in future games. Are you excited yet? Are you leaking below decks? Because you will be when I tell you that in addition to covering this board in stickers and making a copy that's unique and always gradually getting more complicated with every game of Seafall as you explore more territory, there are not one, not two, not eight, but six sealed chests that when you hit certain milestones, you're gonna pop open, filling your game with new components, new rules, new ideas, and telling a new chapter of this dark and stormy story. But unlike Risk and Pandemic Legacy, these boxes don't contain a thing or two. It's not like opening a gift, it's like dumping out the contents of a rich kid's stocking. There is so much in these boxes, it's all waiting for you as well. There's a touch of this abundance even when you start Seafall. This is a game with a lot of rules, a lot of ideas, a lot of mechanics with a long rules explanation and lots of waiting between turns. So much so that I actually wouldn't recommend that you play Seafall with a full five players. Make no mistake, this game is a ponderous galleon rather than a svelte sloop and is going to turn off any players who prefer simple games. So much so, in fact, so big is this game, I'm not going to cover all the rules. I am just going to cover one or two bits of important rigging. All I can hear is ten music students practicing ten different pieces of music, and it's like being in an elevator to hell. The most important decisions you're going to be making in C4 relate to this advisor deck. At the start of every turn, you can pay for one of them to join your council. And once advisors are in your council, you can have them take the lead that turn to make you better at something. For example, you can sail out to an island and use your smuggler, who helps you buy way more stuff, then go home and use your merchant, who helps you sell it for even more. And at the 
end of the year, which is six turns in Seafall, all of your advisors become ready to go again. So, speaking generally, the heart of Seafall is in first, judiciously acquiring a team of about six advisors from a limited shop that you think will work well together. And whether they're a team of merchants, explorers, or whatever else, that sets your course for the game. Oh, and if you're the first one to hire an advisor, you get to name them! Though between games of Seafall, you also get to set a more long-term strategy. Everyone gets to keep one advisor to start the next game with, and you can permanently upgrade one of your ships, forever marking yourself out as, perhaps, the trader or the tyrant. <sighs> This review's turning out to be a little bit stuffy, isn't it? Well, look, let me just have some fun by pointing out, in case you are hungover or a, a wasp, that this is the most exciting setup ever! Creating and naming a cast of characters and islands, and wrecking havoc on them, discovering with every lick of fiction in the captain's book that always, perhaps not as it seems, when you sit down to play your first game of Seafall, there is practically an electric current running through this board game. And that is useful, because something you find out quite quickly is that Seafall isn't always a great game. Let me get out my sticky reviewer's cleaver and roughly chop Seafall into a game of two halves, all right? First off, I'm going to cover the raiding and trading and working with cubes, and then I'm going to talk about the exploring and storytelling, which one player is inevitably going to commit to, go rocketing off into uncharted waters, and spend the whole game being read to, tucked up like a child at bedtime. First, the game of cubes, and when you play the game of cubes, you win or you don't have a very good time. To its credit, Seafall does a good impression of a rewarding, chin-stroking game of maximizing profits. You're calculating where to go, which advisors to buy, what resources to grab, ooh, what upgrades to work towards, and it's hard! This was my personal focus in Seafall, and my friends often had to wait for me to figure out my turn. But, and this be next bit is key, at the end of my puzzling, my friends would also agree that there was no better move I could be making. And playing terminally sensibly like this is fun when you win, and you will win, but if your friends are equally capable, you'll lose just as often and be unable to identify a single turn where you went wrong. It's weird, most games of Seafall have it so that you're just putting the finishing touches on your engine with your advisors and your upgrades and your buildings, and then someone wins, and you scrub all of that off your board. And then we can talk about raiding. Mm -hmm. Now, see, raiding is yet another thing that is fun for the person who does it. You know, you get hilarious mental images of, like, your madman going off and then dragging someone's beautiful, ornate table out of their treasure room. Fun, but kind of miserable if it's happening to you. It is completely passive at best, and at worst, it's infuriating. You spent 20 minutes getting that table. And oh god, let's talk about the milestone cards. These are objectives that control your progression through C4 story, and they are ludicrously generous. Here's the thing, hitting milestones wins you games. That is what they do, you just get an impossible amount of glory for it. But only one person can ever hit a milestone and get the rewards for it, so... You've got two options, neither of which are massively appealing either. You just try and get as much glory as possible in the game. And you'll probably lose because you didn't go for the milestone. Or... You go for the milestone, but only one person can get it, and everyone who doesn't get the milestone is going to have wasted their game. But Seafall does get more tactical and more thought-provoking, with more mechanics and more bored as you play it, right? So I was playing my first five games of Seafall, with every single one going, God, I think maybe next game will be the satisfying game of Seafall, where I feel like I'm in a tight spot because of errors I made strategically. And then eventually I just kind of stopped hoping. Not because that game doesn't eventually show up, but because I was starting to resent playing this thing week in, week out. At the same rate, it was getting better. Anyway, uh, so you've still got the other half of the game, right? The, uh, the Tales of the Arabian Nights-esque storytelling and exploring with the multiple choice adventures. And we love Tales of the Arabian Nights. So, good? I mean, this side of the game was certainly an opportunity, right? An opportunity to fill out who your characters really are, what's happening on these islands, what life is sea like. And listen, I have any number of personal friends who are writers who will tell you how hard it is to fill very, very small word counts with humour and pathos and excitement. And Seafall's Captain's Book is basically just a case study 
in how right those friends are. Both geographically and tonally, we're a thousand miles away from any Arabian nights. The captain's book you read from is almost entirely boring. Though that's not just a comment on the writing, you see, when you're reading out entries for players hitting milestones, whether they explored the highest mountain or sunk the first ship, it's awesome. Your captain gets fleshed out. They're proud or miserable or remorseful. You put a special sticker down. Mm. But due to how Seafall is designed, 95% of what's in a captain's book has to apply to anyone at any island. And it can't further the plot. And it can't introduce characters. And it can't kill them off. So it all ends up reading like so much porridge. You meet some natives, slash some pirates, slash some crew, and you give them resources, slash you keep the resources for yourself, and they don't like that. And it's not even bad, and it's not not entertaining, it's just more like being sat next to someone you don't really know at a dinner party, and that's fine for one night. But, you know, you're playing C4 night after night after night, and gradually you might find yourself taking a dislike to this person. But Quinns, you've done all this walking around with unusually creative framing, and you still haven't talked about the most fun bit, which is the legacy mechanics. Well, you raise a very good point. So let's just go home and do that. The legacy mechanics are at least still first rate. This game has not just the best, but the two best twists ever found in legacy games. That's massive. Obviously, we can't talk about those, but I can talk about some of the small stuff. So whether you win or just finish a game of Seafall or whether you hit a milestone, you get to permanently upgrade advisors and leaders and all sorts of areas of your player board before starting the next game of Seafall. And that is so exciting because this game is so tense and you're playing this opening over and over again that you're, keep, you're thinking to yourself, oh, what can I do with a little extra gold? What can I do with a little extra luck? It's electric. And again, there's that word, electric. You know, it's funny. There's an insane cocktail of emotions when you finish a game of Seafall because... When you finish it, you're going to be relieved that the slightly tedious game is over. You're going to be giddy or annoyed that you won or lost. And you're going to be disappointed, I suppose, that, again, C4 maybe hasn't provided the, uh, the robust and satisfying economic or narrative game that you were looking for. There's a crazy thing. <laughs> Every time my friends and I finished a game of this, we were disappointed when we packed it up and went home. But the next week, just before we were meeting up to play it again, I'd been daydreaming as to what might come next. And I was excited to try it just one more time. And that was week after week after week. Enmity is another mechanic that I absolutely adore. You see, if you sail off to a site and you raid it, and then you take what you want, you have to cover that site with an enmity token, meaning that no one else can raid it, but then at the end of the year, it slides off, goes next to the garrison, and indicates that for you, this island is more defended and the prices are higher. Now, that's fine and all, but here's the thing. At the end of each game of C4, you can only pick up a few enmity tokens, which means if you raid a load of places, or another player, and you give them, like, five enmity tokens, then you can only pick up a few and the rest become permanent stickers forever making that place more expensive and harder to raid so you're cramping your future games of c4 your own style which has you second guessing how long the campaign's gonna be and whether it's worth it for short-term gains and it's mm. so yes every legacy mechanic in c4 is fun and interesting and witty and and it absolutely confirms that legacy is has a sparkling future within board games Legacy is absolutely what keeps Seafall's head above water, for the most part. You see, there's a decision of how to implement the Legacy format in Seafall that I don't agree with. I don't know if it was a good idea, because whereas Pandemic and Risk were solid games from evening one that then proceeded to twist out of your grasp and go spiralling off in a weird direction and you just chased them, Seafall is not a feature complete game when you start playing it. It starts very slowly and you don't really feel that thematically you can do everything you'd expect to until you can open this and this. The glory tracker, which inches up by one every game, don't forget, doesn't feel like it's at a reasonable number for you to play an economic game until game six or seven. And then the story doesn't really... I didn't see where it was going until I'd opened this box and this box and this box and this box. I mean, Christ. This slow unveiling of the curtain across week after week after week is brave and an interesting experiment. But my god, if you're waking players wait for this stuff, it has to be so good and so beautiful as it 
arrives. And it isn't. Ooh, that was a long review, wasn't it? With a lot of words and ups and downs. L let me just help you figure out if you want C4 with one final like mini review at the end of this review, right? My friends and I played six games of C4, took us 50% of the way through the campaign, took us one month, and then we all agreed to stop. But not because we weren't having fun. C4 is never not entertaining, except for maybe the prologue. Um, just because we thought we'd have more fun playing board games we loved, or even trying new board games, or returning to our regular RPG group. C4, then, at least, is true to the age of sale that it emulates, which is that it's not always fun. It is rewarding, though, and it's still a noble expedition into uncharted waters. I'm so glad this game exists, and like I say, it's a shame that we can't talk about, obviously, the secrets in it, or how it handles colonialism, which is to say, very weirdly. Um, you know what? I'd even suggest you do something completely mad. You ready for something mad? If you're interested in board game design, and you are cash rich but time poor, I would even suggest buying C4 and having an incredible evening alone with yourself, learning this game, looking through the decks, and then sort of playing it through in your head, opening each box, look, checking off the milestone, reading through the captain's book, and just exploring everything this game has, peeking behind that curtain that would otherwise rise very slowly, and learning everything the game does in just one evening. You'll have an incredible time. And then, you can seal it all up because of how this game's designed, and you can actually sell it on to another person who, would, who actually wants to play C4, and they can have an amazing and completely flawless time with it. And then everyone gets to see the majesty of this game. So yeah, that's our review of Seafall, everybody. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, we're going to be back next week with a lot more jokes, I think. <laughs>